Hi, I'm Klaus Bilo Christensen, the organizer of Copenhagen Future TV Conference. We are in the heart of Copenhagen, just outside our prestigious hotel Dangelser, where we are going to visit Todd Yellen. Todd Yellen is Vice President of Product Innovation at Netflix. He's going to tell us about future services on the Netflix platform, not just in the US version, but also what's happening specifically here in the Nordic region. Okay, Todd. Welcome to uh, Copenhagen. Oh, thanks. So um, my name is Todd Yellen. I'm the Vice President of Product Innovation for Netflix. So uh, let me flash way back. I grew up in New York City. And so in New York, I basically had as a child like six channels to choose from. Channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, and that was it. And then, you know, whatever they were showing, they were showing, you'd go through it. The next step was cable TV. And in the US, and to some degree, I assume here in Denmark, you have many more channels. And with many more channels came an explosion, but the industry technically didn't keep up with this. So they would use the electronic programming guide, which would just scroll through, you know, painfully and see what's next, what's next. And by the time you got into the, you know, channel 107, your eyes would be glazed over and you'd realize, wow, there's so much going on here. I don't know what I'm gonna watch. Now, with the next step, what we did with Netflix streaming is we unbundled that and instead of TV channels, it becomes a TV and movie app. And with an app, you can get to any piece of content. And you could stream thousands of, of different pieces thousands of different titles. And with thousands of different titles, if we use an electronic programming guide kind of paradigm and it scrolls through, imagine alphabetically, someone would want to take a gun and shoot themselves. That would be painful. So we had to solve that. And so us and some of our competitors been hard at work, and I think we've been leaders in this space, of really making it much easier to navigate through many pieces of content. And we do that in a couple of ways. One of them, and the most important thing, is personalization, which is using the data we know about our customers, using it very privately and securely only to help them, and bubbling up to the top of the user interface what we think they're going to enjoy the most. And then the second thing is to keep on testing, and we do a lot of A-B testing. We do testing to figure out what's the best user interface. What's the best way to navigate on a screen, whether you're using a left, right, up, down remote control, or whether you're on a touch screen tablet, or whether you're dealing with a mouse and keyboard on a computer. So we're getting better and better at making things easier, finding content. Where the future, I think, goes is extending these things. Personalization will get better, user interfaces will get better, and content itself will evolve as, the, as it becomes more and more internet TV and less and less broadcast TV. It opens up a lot of possibilities for how users watch content. How will this affect the good old broadcast industry? So the broadcast industry right now realizes that it needs to evolve. So a lot of them are becoming more and more hybrid services where now they have, you know, many of these companies have an internet component where they take part of their libraries and you use some kind of authentication to prove you're with that service that you're subscribing to. And basically, you know, it's a combination of old school cable network and new school over the top and combining those things. And I think as it moves into the future, it's going to get more and more, internet TV is going to get just bigger and bigger because it has huge advantages. One of them is, like I said, it unbundles all the content and makes it, you can watch whatever show or movie you want, whenever you want. And then the other part is you can watch it not just in your living room where you're wired in, but across many devices, you can be wandering around, whether you're at, you know, commuting to work or you know, driving your car and handing it to your kids or whatever it is. So obviously you are now out on many devices. Uh, could you tell us a little about how many devices Netflix actually are running on right now? Yeah, wow, so it's, it's quite a number. Um, it's into the hundreds, even probably past the thousand at this point. If you look at all the individual TV models and all the set-top boxes, and the different kinds of Android tablets and Apple products and so forth, it expands, you know, over a thousand different devices you can get Netflix to stream. 
Kunne du fortælle os lidt about when, when you test your new services and, and, and test uh, new ways of doing stuff, how do we actually do that? So the way our testing works is there's a few ways you could decide on how to make a service better. One of them is you have the CEO. And the CEO decides everything and it all trickles down to the company and then they do whatever the CEO wants. I call this the Apple model. This is the old Steve Jobs model. Steve Jobs is a once in a century kind of guy, the Thomas Edison of the 20th and early 21st century, and that was all good. But there are only a one in a blue moon or a Steve Jobs or a Thomas Edison born. So most of the time, even if you have a brilliant CEO like Reed Hastings at Netflix, it's better not to let the CEO make all the decisions because sometimes he's wrong about what's going to work on the product. Or a product executive like myself, it's fun to make all those decisions, but I'm not always going to be right. Better to get the users to make the decisions, but not the users in the way most people do it, which is like, ask your users what you want. Because if you ask users what they want, you'll end up building so many different features, the thing will explode of complexity. What you really want to do is let the user's behavior decide And the way we test things is we'll try an idea, whether we get that idea from me or Reed or someone who works on my team or any team across Netflix, or we'll look at a competitor and try something they're doing, or we'll listen to our users. I was just in Denmark a couple of months ago and users had all kinds of suggestions. So we'll try an idea where tens of thousands of new Netflix members globally will get this new version of Netflix. It could be the smallest thing or it could be this whole new different way to interact with Netflix. And tens of thousands of people will get the existing experience. They're all chosen randomly. They don't know they're in a test cell. And then we watch. And the ones who have the new experience, are they streaming more content? Are they sticking with our service, our subscription service longer? If they are, boom, we have a new winner and we roll it out to anyone. If they're not, our guess was wrong and we'll try something else. What have you observed here in the Nordic region from users' behavior that might be different from what uh, your American users are doing? So people in the Nordic countries, um, Denmark specifically, but the rest of the countries in this region, they tend to be a little more technically sophisticated. They're early adopters. They tend to you know, be on top of things. You, know, you guys have amazing broadband. You guys tend to get devices a lot more quickly. So for example, tablets, they're exploding globally. But you know, the growth is even earlier here in Denmark and the rest of the Nordic countries. So we get even more streaming on tablets. We get a lot of it globally. We get even more here. So it gives us almost an early look into what devices might be succeeding and how to do better on a device like a tablet. But in other ways, when we do A-B testing, I tend to see that it's less important what country you're from. I even tend to see it's less important what gender or what age you are. And it's more important, are you a science fiction geek? Or are you like a crazy sentimental lover of romantic comedies? Or are you both? So I tend to think of users in those kinds of terms and then they, those kinds of users test in different ways and we try to make them happy as opposed to you're, you're Danish, you're Canadian, you're Brazilian. You obviously have really a lot of amount of data uh, showing you what people are actually doing, a lot of user behavior data, more than we've ever seen in the history of television, I, I guess. So uh, original content are now coming uh, quite frequently. Do we do we think we will see some local um, production of uh, original content? And could you tell a little more about what, what to expect from Netflix within original? Yeah, so in the world of originals, today is a super exciting day because when we're recording this very interview, we're launching a new show called Orange is the New Black. And we're not launching it, you know, traditionally there's been a lot of American shows. They launch in the US. And then months later, it comes eventually to you know, Denmark and the rest of Europe. And that, I would imagine, could be quite frustrating. But when we launched Orange the New Black, which we did literally minutes ago, we flipped the switch and everyone got it at the same time. So that's part of the excitement of creating global original content for Netflix, and that's the new model of TV. So how we see originals is an important part is as Netflix gets better, and bigger, and we have more members, we can invest in more and more original series. Diversity is really important. So we're going to have like, you know, we have great 
original kids content coming from DreamWorks. We're partnering on them. We're going to have these TV shows based on popular DreamWorks characters that will only be on Netflix. And we have our horror show with Hemlock Grove, and we'll probably be making more horror. And we have a science fiction series coming up with, from the Wachowskis probably sometime you know, in the next year or two that we've already signed a deal on. Very excited about that. So, and then as we, you know, as we get more and more originals, we'll learn from our data what tends to do well, what doesn't. But right now we think we have an edge because we know how many people are gonna watch a really gory horror show versus a very edgy, dark comedy. And so based on that, we know how much to invest in that show and it gives us a good idea. And here's a very important fact. As opposed to linear programmers who have to show, like, I have to win 8 p.m. on Wednesdays. And that from 8 to 9 is important. And if it does, this show doesn't do well enough from 8 to 9 on Wednesdays, I'm canceling that show. Netflix doesn't have to do that. We launch an original show like Orange is the New Black, and now we can spread the cost out of that over years. And you could watch it whenever you want. So we can let shows really find themselves and develop themselves and so forth and really make a show, you know, let it live in a much broader way and let users watch it when they want to watch it, which really opens us up both to more interesting content from creators and also opens up our users to watching it when they want to watch it. It's quite obvious that you have taken a leading position in the conference where you have launched your service, but uh, who do you see, what do you see as your main competitors in the near future? So the way, you know, as a product guy, as a guy who's trying to make Netflix better to how we consume the content and to make the picture great and how to make movie and TV show discovery great, I look at competition as opportunity, A, to get ideas, If we see a competitor, I don't care if it's HBO or if it's Viaplay, if we see them doing something great, we'll A-B test it and we'll see if it works great for our users. And if it doesn't, we'll go like, hmm, they really shouldn't be doing that, but you know, that's the way it goes. Or it's a great thing, we'll put it in our service we'll, so we pay attention. And then the other thing is a motivator. You know, this is, see a competitor do well, it makes you that much better. And it, you know, where we have Silicon Valley roots, And there's no more faster moving place of you better come up with the next idea and stay on top of things. So competition just pushes us ahead. Uh, you talked about companion screen, second screen watching. When, when people are watching a show, can you t say a little about uh, what do you see people do behavior wise? Do they continue a show watching on, on from the sofa on their tablet. Uh, is there a, a, a dynamic kind of uh, usage of different devices of your service? Yeah, so second screen, is a, it, it's in its infancy right now. There's a lot of companies investing in it pretty heavily, including us, because we think it's the future. But right now, there are only power users using a second screen. So what one thing we have noticed that I'm happy to share is that, you know, It works on both these kinds of devices, a tablet device and more of a smartphone. But we're getting, we're seeing more second screen usage with smaller screens because I think they're more portable and easy. But I think this will become more and more important as people start having this like just sitting there on their coffee table. And it's also easier to navigate on a bigger screen as you move through. But this is just more convenient because it tends to be round and it tends to be very handy. Um, where we see it going is I already talked about in terms of its smartness and makes Netflix more portable. As far as what you can do on the screen, you can use it as a remote, just typical play, fast forward, rewind, stop. You can also have it playing on that screen as you use this screen to browse and find something different to watch. Then you can hit play on this and change what's up there. You can also just take back what's over there onto a screen like a tablet or a phone and then walk back to, you know, you're watching in your living room and then seamlessly take the picture with you and go into another room and keep on watching in bed or something if you want to finish up a show. I'm asked a lot and I get one idea I get pitched all the time where there's a lot of companies around the world, particularly in Silicon Valley, are the excitement of making your experience what's going on the big screen richer by what can go on the small screen. So this is a scenario you probably have heard a lot as well, which is 
I could find out what dress Meryl Streep is wearing in that scene, and I could figure out, my wife could figure out where, where to buy it and what it costs, and you know, we're, how about those cool sunglasses that George Clooney's wearing? When I like those sunglasses too? So obviously we're not in the advertising business at all at Netflix, so I, I don't have to, it's an easy decision. I'm not into advertising, you know, because I represent Netflix and that's not what we do. But how about if you could find out other interesting stuff, like who is that character actor in the background? I've seen that guy in like 10 movies, who is that person? I'm not sure that's gonna take off. We'll probably, you know, further down the line, we'll probably experiment with supplemental information on your second screen. And the reason I'm, I have a little bit of skepticism whether it'll take off is because when you watch TV, and this is what we were talking about before, you want it to be more passive, more relaxing. You don't want it to be, you're not doing homework. You're not looking up everything and wanting to see the price of that dress or the sunglasses of George Clooney when you're watching. But sometimes you're curious, and it might be enough of a use case. I know um, HBO did a sophisticated second screen app for Game of Thrones where they had all like the mapping of the different kingdoms on the tablet and you could do what, where, you know, while you're watching. I also you know, have a strong hunch that it was used by very few people. Very power user would have done that. So I could see trying that and we'll try that probably for Netflix in the future, but I wanna make sure it's something that will be used more widely and it won't be used by just a few real edge case folks. So could you talk a little more about your coming services? Sure. So we're always trying to make the service better and we have features that are you know, launching. We test them first and if something succeeds, then we'll put it out there to the market. So something I've heard a lot in Denmark, particularly in some of the other countries around here is how come they have the ability to have this wish list functionality in the US called the instant queue? And how come you didn't give it to us and what's going on there? And the, the answer to that is, is pretty straightforward and it's twofold. And the second part of the answer is good news. <laughs> but the first part of the answer is how come we didn't just launch with it when we started here? It would have been easy technically, but the reason we didn't launch with it goes back to three years ago when we launched Netflix in our first other country besides the US, which was Canada. So Canada was a brand new service. We wanted to see how things would play. And since our history is when, you know, a long time ago, and we still do this in the US, is shipping DVDs to people via the mail and keeping a list of what you want shipped next, this idea of a queue was very much tied to our DVD service. On a streaming service where you could just click and play, why do you really need to build up a list? Because it doesn't tell us what to ship if you can just click and play. But then users would go, well, I need to write something on a post-it. I need to write it on a pad. Why can't you just put that on the website or something and make it easy? We tested that in Canada, and not only did it not do well, it actually did worse. So we did one of those large scale tests. Tens of thousands had an instant queue, which we were calling it. We're probably gonna call it my list or something like that. We haven't determined yet. Because we are launching it in Denmark was the second part, and we're launching around the world very soon in the next couple of months. So when we tried it in Canada at first, People who had it streamed less and they didn't retain with Netflix as long. And the reason we think that is, is because it's adding complexity. You want it to be simple. It's another thing to think about. It's more cognitive load. I have to make another decision. I'm keeping this list. Now I have to do this. So it was a little complicated, especially with left, right, up, down, and multiple device. So we didn't launch it in Canada, and then we didn't launch it when we launched in Brazil and Mexico and UK and then Denmark. We didn't launch it until we had something that was simple enough that would test well. And finally we tested something where it was a little simpler, it was a little more embedded into the experience, and I could talk about ways that make it better than the old version. And so now finally, now that we have it right, of course we're thrilled to launch it here and you know, we know it fulfills something that users have been asking for. So one of the things that made it better is not all users want it, it gets in their way. So what we're doing now is we're doing an adaptive row. So as you know, 
you know, your viewers probably know Netflix tends to be in these rows of different kinds of things. Here's my dark crime dramas. Here's my feel-good romantic comedies. So one of the rows is here's my list. If you don't use that list, instead of keeping it on the top, it will slowly move its way down until you use it and it will be all the way on the bottom of the UI and it won't get in your way. If you start using it, it goes higher and higher and will make it to the top so it stays out of your way. Another thing is the list tended to get stale. You, list, you, you, know, you add what you want and then you see the same few titles to begin your experience. That doesn't feel good. So what we did instead is we use our algorithms to dynamically change based on what we think you'll like at that moment up to the top of the list. So we're changing the order. If you liked your order, you can go onto the website and go, always use the order I did it, so you can have more control. We know that will only be a small percent of users, but we want to keep them happy. So we've added some stuff to make it a little less friction, to make it easier. So that's how we made it better, so as not to make it, you know, to add to that couch potato lore of watching TV. And when will you be launching that team? Within the next, um, we're actually working on doing the final polishing of it now. We test it first, but we don't test a perfect version. And then we polish it some, we get it so it can scale to millions of users and so it technically works. And so within the next two months, by the end of the summer, you know, it will be out to Denmark and the rest of Netflix. So um, this is Netflix on the PlayStation 3. So notice how flat and simple the thing is. It's just rows. It gives you the, all the information here. This just didn't happen. This was through a lot of A-B testing. This kind of simplicity took a lot of testing. That being said, this has been the interface for the last couple of years. And we just ran a successful test that's done really well, that keeps it as simple, but keeps the imagery, gets the imagery to be a lot richer. So you can expect this to evolve. By the end of this year, you're going to see the next evolution of Netflix, what we call the 10-foot UI, which is Netflix 10 feet away on your TV set, is going to get better. So let me show you one other thing that's getting better. I mentioned before Netflix lists. What's called in the US as the instant queue, we're changing the, lit, the name to probably my list. And so this is a US account because it hasn't rolled out yet. But here you can see. Here's list. I don't think it's going to be called your list. We're going to change this name. But now we're going to launch sometime by the end of the summer the ability to keep your own list of whatever you want to watch on top. And so you can go to any title. Say if I see like, oh, popular on Netflix, there's Hunger Games. Netflix must have just got that. I click on Hunger Games. And then I can go like, oh, add to your list. I add Hunger Games. Now it's on the list. And now I can go back up and you'll see you know, a curated list. For those who use it a lot, we're going to keep it right on top of the UI. For those who barely ever use it or don't use it at all, we're going to drop it lower and lower so it doesn't get in the way of finding great content to watch. Get the max from Netflix. Why, hello. Take your pick. In this experience, you pick a genre they might be in the mood for. Robots and or magic. Sure thing. You know what comes next. The rating game. Ready, set, go. To then rate a few titles like this. And finally, Max will go back and do his magic and give you a suggestion. Battlestar Galactica. You up for it? From here, you can get another suggestion or you can listen to the 30 second pitch. That's my job. It's man versus machine time and the machines look like us. Even worse, these Cylons can do human stuff. Oh, I have got something awesome here for you. If you're feeling dangerous, I say we just hit play right now, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. What do you think? Another option for Max is called a Max's Call. This is where Max selects a TV show or a movie just for you based on what he already knows about you. So he's so sure you're going to like it, he's not even going to tell you what it is. You just have to hit play. And then you have in, uh, in the US lounge the Max service being your first attempt to communicate directly with speech to the users. Yeah, let me talk about voice. voice. We, did, we did launch Max. So Max is a talking UI. 
It actually talks to you. He's got a lot of personality. He actually has what I hope is a good sense of humor. We have some very good writers on it. But it's a very interactive, you know, you don't talk to it yet, and it only works on the PlayStation 3, and it's only in the US. And so it basically, Max will give you suggestions after you answer a few questions, a few clicks, and it just makes it more fun to find what to watch, and it simplifies the process. But it's in the early stages. So the reason we didn't launch that, we only launched it on the PS3, only in the US, is because it's good enough to launch in one place, but honestly, one of the things that's hardest to do internationally is comedy. Humor does not travel very well. You know, you can ask any, you know, producer, whether you're, you know, a producer in India making a Bollywood thing or you're a producer in LA making a Hollywood thing, it doesn't tend to go that well internationally. So we're going to perfect it in the US, we're going to get it better and better, and then eventually we're going to localize it and, you know, put it into other countries. But it's, I would say it's not ready for international prime time yet. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that if you should launch that kind of service in Denmark, say, you would have to do it in, the, in local kind of humor and obviously in Danish language also. That's right. But you won't do that until you have tested if it actually works, if people like it. That's exactly it. I, wanna, I would love to test it in Denmark and other countries and make sure that the sensibility is right, the tone of the thing is right, and also getting the language right and so forth. And there's a lot of, so that's, that's going to take some time. So it's not going to be soon. That's going to take a lot of work. That's the future. Could you talk a little more about uh, profiling uh, in also what you have launched now or you will be launching soon, w profiling? Also? Imminent. So within the next few weeks, that's earlier in the summer, I expect um, the list functionality, what used to be called Instant Queue in the US, to launch by the end of the summer. And I expect globally, we haven't launched this in the US either, it's launching globally for profiles to launch um, within the next few weeks. And so how that works, I can show you. So personalization is really important to Netflix. And so what that means is, like I said, we pay attention to what people watch. If they want to put in any preferences, we pay attention to how much they watch it a show or a movie? Did they watch the whole thing or they watch only a few minutes of it and abandon the thing? Did they watch the whole TV show in a week or did they spread it over five months? So we pay attention to all these signals. What did they watch yesterday versus six months ago and we weight it differently. But right now the way it works is we're really personalizing not for each person but for your household. So you know I have my wife Jen and sometimes we watch together but sometimes she watches stuff I have no interest in and vice versa. And then I have my seven and nine year old children. And so sometimes you'll see all these kitty content all over my, you know, my website. And a lot of parents, I'm sure, will recognize that happens to them. So instead, what if you can separate it out? And I could put, here's me, here's, you know, and then I click into myself and I get like, that's my experience. If I want to go into, well, Jen, my wife, she wants a different experience. So we launch it for her, and it's going to work on all devices. I'm just showing it on a tablet, but it'll work on all devices. So here's the kind of stuff that Jen will like and so forth, and it's different. Here's her romantic comedies and exciting movies and suspenseful. So different people, and if I go to, you know, my daughter, Samara, it will launch Netflix for kids, and it will go into their kids' area. and. Samara is different than Oliver, so she might like these characters. So even though both of them have access to all the different characters and all the different content Netflix has, we'll bubble to the top, once again, to make it easier. You know, stuff for Samara based on what she's watching versus Oliver, if I went into Oliver, you get a different experience. And so it just separates it out. People don't have to use this. We tried to make it really easy, but we found in test a large minority of people were using this. And so, and it went well, it improved, it didn't add too much complexity, it increased streaming, it improved retention. Now, you know, your viewers might be asking, well, this is an obvious thing to do, why don't you do this right when we launched in Denmark, or why don't you do it before you launched in Denmark? And the answer is, once again, simplicity is really hard to accomplish. It should look easy to the user, and we, we should take all the complexity out and we had tested it before and we didn't quite have it down yet. 
So just like the list functionality, it takes time to make it easy enough. And we're going to keep on improving this kind of thing. So in the future, we plan on making it better and better. But right now, it's at a good enough stage where it will add more value and less complexity. Do, will you introduce some kind of a, a password that you have to, or will it basically be an icon like you just showed? That's a good question. So we debated around that. Should we add a password protected area to different people? And we found that that adds more friction and it doesn't do as well. And now, you know, you might wonder, well, for kids, it does protect kids. But in a world of open internet, even parents who use filters to protect their kids, stuff is out there. So we wanted to just create a very, what we call a well-lit cul-de-sac. Little area that you know the kids are in and they can play and they're safe and it looks different and it feels different and there's only kids content, but we still want to make it easy enough to switch from one thing to the other so people actually use it. If we added too many layers, people won't use it so parents will be less safe because it'll be too much of a pain to switch back and forth with things and then the kids will just end up watching what the parents are watching. So we found this is the better solution. So how did you actually get it to look like this on, on the PS3? I mean, if you use uh, Netflix on the Apple TV box, the interface is quite different, more Apple-like, so to say. Are you restricted by Sony to have it look on a specific so, way? So um, Sony, Apple and Sony are both great partners. We've been partnering with both of them for years. Um, we have more freedom on the user interface. So we're a dynamically generated user interface on the PS3 meaning it comes from our servers, we can change it whenever we want, we can test all kinds of things. Whereas on Apple, we work within the Apple ecosystem, and most devices, by the way, of Netflix nowadays, are the PS3 model. If you're watching Netflix on your Samsung TV, on your LG, on your Sony, whatever, we generate dynamically what that user interface, and same thing for other Apple products, the iPhone, the iPad. The Apple TV is an exception to this. The Apple TV has its own ecosystem, the way that Apple likes it to look. So we can change little things. We still personalize and send your list, but the overall look and feel of Netflix on the Apple TV is more Apple-like. So when you, you said that you were changing the look of uh, the PS3, does that go also for the other PS3, like looking uh, at the uh, versions of your interface, like on the Roku box, will it also change when you change that as well? So when we change the PS3, we're going to roll it out to a couple of different devices. We're working on the rollout strategy right now, and we expect to get it onto you know, probably the Xbox, probably eventually the Roku, probably a bunch of different smart TV sets and so forth. It will take a little time, but not that long. Within a few months, we'll be on many Netflix devices with the new UI. When you're doing UIs like that, and you said that you have been testing this, do you do the same? Do you select some of your users and then the test you test the look of it and see how they react on it? Is that That's exactly what we did. Right. So but you, don't, you don't have any feedback from users other than looking at what they're actually doing? We, we do. I mean, what we do, the first step we would do on a user interface like this or on the new one we're going to launch or on old ones that we tried is we'll sit there with the big one-way mirror in user testing and we'll watch, you know, tens, you know, probably 50, 100 users play with a different user interface. And we'll take notes and we'll try to sharpen it and make it better but we're not convinced it works until we A-B test it with tens of thousands of users. And if it works then, then we roll it out. Okay, very exciting to see. So, if we go back to the future, why do you see Netflix in, let's say, three, five years? So, certainly, um, we're going to have a lot of, you know, a lot more content, a lot more Netflix originals spread across a lot, di many different categories and so forth. Um, so that's step one. Step two and how we deliver that content, I imagine it's going to be some combination of more and more second screen control of your TV and more and more voice interaction with your TV and so forth. Um, I think people are going to get more and more comfortable with social than they are right now. So when it came to personalization, people were uncomfortable at first. They thought like, well, this is like George Orwell. They're watching everything I do. But I've watched over the years, people are getting more and more comfortable, especially with us, because we're not in advertising. So we, we have no interest in using your data for anything but helping you. So we keep it very close to in, and people are comfortable with that. People aren't as comfortable with sharing things socially. Younger people are, 
but not, you know, you know, my generation, our generation as much, but the younger generation, yes. So I think TV will get more social. I think it will get more second screen and more flexible, more voice oriented, and we'll have richer in content. And the content itself will start breaking more and more of the traditions of length of episodes and how many episodes and what genre it fits into. And it's going to be more, it's going to be freer what creators can do with the content. And your business model as it is right now, licensed content of uh, back catalog primarily and then your own uh, original content, will you change that sometime in the future? Maybe being also a place for uh, uh, transactional services like uh, video on demand for brand new movies, will that some think, do you think that will be something that will be We're not, re at this point, w I doubt that we're going to go into that. We have no plans right now to go into newer content video on demand. We think some competitors do it really well. And if we added that, it would just make the Netflix service itself more complex. You'd look at, oh, I have to pay extra for that one. Oh, that one's part of the service. And it would be more of an annoyance factor. So, you know, when I we've played with that and we've done like, you know, just research around it, it seems like it adds more complexity. So we'll let competitors deal with video on demand, where we like the one flat fee, simple model of subscription. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for coming to Copenhagen. And My enjoy pleasure, your class. Thank you for sure. uh, sharing your insight into the future of television. You're very welcome. Something. I enjoyed it.